Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. You all have heard me say this before that we all should have the right to be who we want to be, be seen as who we truly are, and hey, it's just clothes anyway, right? You've heard me all say these sort of things that hey, why not dress the way you want to dress, 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 and be who you are so that you can be comfortable in your life and. Live your life well. Well, I'm going to be interviewing a uh, trans um, woman. Her name is Cecilia Daniels. And that's exactly what she's doing. She is being trans her way. Uh, she, uh, she, she dresses the way she wants to dress. Is known as, as a woman the way she wants to be. And here's where she came from. Growing up as a lonely, um, closeted trans child in a conservative, middle-class Christian home in southern India. Cecilia writes and speaks passionately about her mental health and her gender incongruence and social challenges that she faced in her family, work, school, community, both in the U.S. and in India. As a professional, she is a management consultant with over 25 plus years of demonstrated success in operations, growing and spearheading media, healthcare, and life science engagements for Fortune 100 companies like Amgen, Genetech, United Health, Blue Cross, AmeriChoice. I'm sure there are others. As a senior regional executive with companies like um, Evecchia, uh, Cap Begemini, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these names. Even Dun and Bradstreet, everybody knows who Dun and Bradstreet is. As she has managed global cross-functional teams, implemented enterprise strategies, maximizing ROI for multi-billion-dollar clients. She has been consistently recognized for consumer satis- customer satisfaction and employee empowerment. She has a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science. She also advocates for LGBTQ community with providers, payers, pharmaceuticals, and policymakers in the U.S. and South Asia. She strives to make LGBTQ communities particularly 
the trans community feel welcome, accepted in all facets of society, from bathroom to boardroom. Let me tell you, um, after talking to Cecilia and realizing some really cool things about her, that she even made me feel a little more comfortable in my own skin. So, why don't we welcome Cecilia to, to the show and let's hear what she has to say in her story about being trans and being trans her way, not someone else's way. <laughs> Cecilia, welcome to the show, and it's a pleasure meeting you again, and I, get, um, I said off air, you're a beautiful person, and I love how you have found your way through life, and there's a, there's a story that goes along with this, and I want to give you a, a ch- an open chance to tell that story, because it's actually a wonderful story of how a... A wonderful person has has made it through life. So, yeah. Why don't we start there? Tell us a little bit sure. about your story, to how you got to where you are now. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for this opportunity. Uh, I know we had some conversations, and it's led to this uh, beautiful dialogue where we want to really bring that acceptance. And I want to give you a quick idea about who Celia is. Now... I was. Uh, I am a South Asian. I am an immigrant. I am a parent. I am a musician. I am an entrepreneur. I am a blogger. I am a hiker. I love snorkeling. But when I came out as trans, always that Celia is trans and Celia is trans, and all they could do was they just box me into that little thing uh, box and said Celia is a trans person. Being trans is not my agenda. Being a human being, and, uh, how it all is when I four years of the mom back in southern part of India it was a small it was a city called Chennai I grew up in that city and I told my mom that I wanted to be a girl my mom looked at the social constructs created by the colonial British car which was so binary and she said you're a boy and you cannot wear your cousin's clothes but she let me do that because uh, they had had two kids and both of them are boys at the time my brother and um, they wanted a girl and so it's part of a culture where if you don't have a girl in the family they dress the boy take pictures just helping uh, you know seeing how it looks like and uh, pictures of myself in uh, as a child and I also started pursuing wearing my cousin's clothes for a while and there was a time when my mom told me probably around seven she told me that you're a boy you cannot wear your cousin's clothes and I threw tantrums at the time that's the time I found shame it was you know you cannot wear a girl's clothes girl and women were treated as second-rated citizens in India at the time in early 70s was a patriarchal society it was more prominent for women it was more prominent for men and women were not in so many areas my mom for great example though she grew up in in, a, in she was able to speak up and she was a working woman who raised us but what she didn't understand is the child was going through something that my mom questioned as to why is my son different? What is going on with him? Mm-hmm. He has these imaginary thoughts. He has an imaginary girl who is called, yeah, who is this person? Why is he talking about Celia? And I created an idea myself that this feminine, feminine me was my identity at the time. And, I, it was, and Celia was... 
and these are all traumas and way of coping with your identity issues I remember the traumas were layered and then there was a I want to give trigger warning for you who are listening to this conversation the conversations we're going to have is going to be difficult because the lives of trans people are not pretty you know there's a lot of moments where we cannot even share our experiences it could be triggering for some of you I nevertheless want to share because it's absolutely important I remember in my fourth grade my uncle um, molested me and I did not know how to cope up with that as a child. Two years later I just discarded it because I thought you know this is my uncle I don't think he meant it. Two years later my cousin did that to me. That's when I felt like why are these people doing it doing such things to a, a little boy and I'm a girl inside but why are they doing it? Is it because I'm trans? I had a lot of questions and I just took that shame and I just embraced it because I felt like I didn't want to tell my mom it was so shameful in India I went to talk about all these the abuse that you're going through I just let go of it but the trauma never it was always taunting me for a very long time I also felt like I wanted to be myself and in my ninth grade I picked up the courage and I said I'm going to go out and be silly. I wore a skirt, I stitched a skirt actually, I wore that skirt and I wore a top and I was walking out, I put a scarf around my head, I was walking out. It didn't go very well, by the security guard at the construction site and they, they publicly humiliated me. They said all kinds of derogatory words in the Indian, Indian dictionary. And I was made to stand and they mocked at me, almost 15 to 20 adults. That was the day I decided that I won't be able to come out or I felt like people like me, such worthless scums in the society and that's how they called me. They said, you're such a disgrace to the community. Who's your dad? Be your dad and let him know that their son is up and walking around like a woman, like a little girl. It's absolutely disgusting. I spoke in an and ran away from that site. didn't follow me because I was very quick. I came back home couple of days and next couple of weeks I was contemplating suicide self-harm was weak in my life I was always choking myself and it was really really hard and I wanted to kill myself I hated this femininity in me being trans is not a lifestyle choice it's who we are we are born this way mm -hmm. but people don't realize it I didn't want to be trans and I was trying to do everything in my life possible <laughs> to <laughs> avoid being a trans person Growing up in India, it wasn't easy being trans because you're always marginalized as a hijra community. When you look at the hijra community in India, it's a fourth world culture. Where ostracized in the community, they were they were considered as sex workers, performers, and beggars. And when I looked at them, I felt like I am you, but I'm I don't. Be. I could relate to them, but I didn't want to do what they were doing. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to really have a family. I wanted to do something, but I still felt like I had a femininity in me. I was always attracted to women. I was never attracted to men. That's another confusion that always crept in me because I didn't know the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. I always confused both of them and I felt like if I'm attracted to a girl, why am I wanting to be a girl? And that's the part I didn't understand. Yeah. So it went through lots of cycles. Um, yeah, I got married. <laughs> I got married to a beautiful woman and I was attracted to her. And at the same time, I felt like I wanted to tell her about what was going on. And I, I seriously assumed in some crazy way that if I marry a cisgender girl, my transness would go away. So I married her and I came to this country. I was an entrep I was doing a lot of business development in Bradstreet at the time. It was one of the reputed companies and I worked for, um, I, I came here for an assignment with J.P. Morgan Chase in New York. I was very successful in my, in my business, in my education. I did my master's in computer science. I was a person who was able to really do well in my corporate life. But my personal life was a, such a wreck. I was, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I controlled my emotions. I was always 
upset, I was angry, I was anxious. Sometimes I felt like I was not the person I am. I felt like I was leading a dual life. And uh, four years after Amisha, I told my wife about my my life. And um, I had a baby and she was two years old. So we were struggling as a family to understand what would happen. My wife was absolutely worried because she knew I wasn't gay, but at the same time she didn't know that my identity hidden. Mm-hmm. So I did work with some therapists, were Christian therapists at the time, and they told me I was a feminine gay. <laughs> I didn't for the love and what is feminine gay mean? But anyway, I, I told them I'm not attracted to men and that gay word gay doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to me and then they, they said you know you're probably a transsexual you need to be a transsexual so that you can that's, that's the way to go and you have your wife life as a cross dresser i was confused at the time because the only choice i had was a cross dresser or a transsexual and i said i i could i can't identify myself in either of these categories i think i belong somewhere in because something to do internally, it's not about externally being a dress and walking around wasn't a thing. Though I express myself, my femininity through uh, dressing up, I was expressing something that was internal to me. I, I, I read so many articles and I started discovering as to why am I, what is wrong with me? And I just stood by that at the time I just thought I was gender fluid or I didn't have terms this was like 2008 or 2000 there was not much of vocabulary around the trans community I knew I was somewhere in that spectrum within the gender identity but I didn't know between the both binaries but I didn't know where I was and um, I remember talking to a lot of people and one of them said, you know, Celia, you need to transition. You have to medically transition because that's the way to go. And we have transitioned, we have families, I've lost my job, but we're still happy. And to me, it was important. Family was important. The same, my personal well-being was important to me. Well, I didn't know how to handle that. And that's when I started thinking about how can I keep all this at the same time still live my life authentically and I remember in, in my community um, those days when Caitlyn Jenner came out um, this was um, you know it was a big news and it felt like I was already out there in the, I was I will live a couple of exits you know she if um, I can identify within this but a lot of children they started coming out and they started speaking up because the parents could relate to relate to what Caitlyn Jenner had done. And they told the dads and the parents that, hey, if you can relate to why Caitlyn Jenner transitioned, I'm, I'm always been like this. So there was change within our support groups that we had. And uh, I used to go to a support group and there were a lot of trans kids, who came, parents who came in. And I started thinking about what to do and how to change what is going on. And I knew that my story was because uh, there were times when I was abused at um, in, a, in a bar. Whenever I go out, I was always called names. And um, I was discriminated at work too. So I could not, um, after I came out, I, I could not work in the corporate industry. After 25 years, I decided I need to come out. And I did come out and that was a professional suicide. <laughs> yeah, I, I had such a great, and I had a great, Position, but I was struggling deep inside. I could not even. I I woke up every morning thinking I don't want to go to work. To be someone else. I don't want to wear that suit, and do this business conversations with people like everything is okay, I'm not okay. And um, I started coming out and I started applying for jobs, but nothing worked out. You know, they didn't want people at trans folks at a senior level. They are willing to hire trans people as just to check a box, but they are not willing right. to hire trans people to really empower them. And that I felt like um, almost 50 companies I walked in and out and yeah. for a period of almost a year I was a job. My savings was depleting and I didn't know how to manage my life. And that's when my wife told me that, you know, you need to start 
thinking about starting your own and I did I started my own company and I went to this company's leader and offered jobs and I said hey I can consult with you because I have so much of experience in healthcare and life sciences and they brought me I started consulting with them of course during in the workplace I went through a lot of discrimination not just as a trans person or a gender diverse person but more as an Asian as an immigrant yeah, and there's always this fear of someone taking away their jobs and look at this trans lady from India who's an immigrant she's taking away my job that's the way they started looking at me not just the fear of being a trans person in the workplace and that's when I started playing up my intersectionality as I said being trans is important to me but being an Asian a person of color in the workplace and fighting against these this discrimination is absolutely important and that's when I started yeah. speaking up and later in my life I heard that I was neurodivergent um, I had interacted with some of my friends and they told me why don't you really check what's going on in your life and I found that I was a person I could check all the three categories in those four categories that people have for employment in a Asian, I'm a, tra a gender non-binary, and then I am a disability, um, uh, invisible disability, but I'm not a veteran. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could check that box too. So I found that there's so much that's going on and we need to speak up and how can we change and I became an advocate, I started speaking up and I started going bold, politically act, corporate life and also within my faith, being a Christian to me as a trans person it was absolutely important I don't want to compromise on people told me that God hates you I didn't care I, l I have read the Bible in and out and I know that God has created me this way mm -hmm. and he has a purpose in my life and that made me to speak up in the faith community speak up for children speak up for folks who are marginalized in the workplace speak up in the health equity issue in the if, you know when it comes to health care and uh, I am here today and if you ask me, you know, Celia, what would you like to do in the next 20 years or, you know, as, as long as you live, I would say I will do exactly what I'm doing today. Yeah. I want to empower trans folks and I want to see them become leaders. I want to see them as astronauts. I want to see them as entrepreneurs in the world where we are struggling today. Yeah. So that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> well, I, I, I have a question about... Uh, I, I like how you in that you want to see see trans people become um, astronauts, astronauts and uh, all all these other wonderful yes. things, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, I I do re remember that there was a TV show. Well, we're going to quote it a TV show. Um, it actually appeared on Netflix only, um, mm -hmm. where they had a. And I'm not exactly sure how I feel about the term non-binary, because it it adds restrictions and it adds um, stereotypes that aren't necessarily there. But there was a non-binary actor in it, and mm -hmm. I'm like thinking, it's like, hey, um, there's somebody who's who's not not just strictly male or female, mm -hmm. and this story is taking place in space. We could do this, right? Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. my my thing is is do you do you Cecilia feel great like you're a great human being? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. you're asking me if I, yeah. I feel. Like I'm a human being? <laughs> I won't say I'm a perfect human being, but I um, no great, not perfect. Yeah, great. I am a I'm a human being. I wouldn't use the word great. Uh, I'm a human being, and, yeah. and um, I would love to see the greatness in people, and, and that's what okay. makes us all great. Um, in one of the things when you mentioned about gender non-binary and binary, I just wanted to also explain to the audience is to, within the transgender spectrum, there are two categories. One is binary and gender non-binary. Binary are to transition from male to female, female to male, social or medical, mm -hmm. and sometimes legal. But non-binaries are folks who identify, who neither identify as male or female, they identify as a spectrum. For me, instance, uh, I, I use the pronouns they because I identify and uh, when I use she and they, that means that I'm more feminine presenting in the gender non-binary spectrum. 
And if someone uses he and they, that means they are more leaning towards the masculine side of the gender non-binary spectrum. If someone uses they and them, that means that they belong, want to identify in either feminine or masculine side. They want to create their own identity, but they don't want to just lean towards the binaries that the society has created. Binaries were created as a way to reproduce, as a way to bring both children into the world. Um, but it's not the norm that has to for that has to be strictly followed in every aspect of life, and that's where I yeah. think people misunderstand, uh, and they have never given thought to this percentage of people who are probably like 1.8 million in this in in you. Um, yeah. You know, this is a very small population, and when yeah. people say, when someone says, "I don't identify," it means. They don't relate to it. They don't feel like uh, they are feminine, or and they just feel like they are a human being. And that's what I think um, people identify when they say they are. Yeah. Just non-binary. Yeah, because uh, because I I I just prefer to see people just simply put as the way as a are. human mm -hmm. as a human being the way they are, and um, as far as. I'm, I keep going back to the example of space because I love space. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, it's it's such a great example of how of the physics oh, yeah. of our of 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 our universe. Um, so you're a computer expert, and the, hey, the the next the, uh, space trip out there, they could use your particular set <laughs> of. Should it matter? Mm -hmm. If you're the if you're the expert and you're the one that can get the job done, should it matter that you're Cecilia, right? It's like it, 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 sh it shouldn't yeah. matter. It should just matter that you're the person to get the job mm. done. And right, it's a it's a social construct in, on Earth. Uh, let's say, if, uh, you know, being on the topic of uh, sci-fi, uh, if an alien comes down to Earth and looks at us, what would be the first question? Let's say the alien you what would the alien call you they won't call you a male or female they'll call you as an earthling they will call you as a human being hey are you a human being they won't call you male or female the earthlings uh, the, the, the yeah. you know the, the those aliens won't know because they may populate their own planet in a different way yeah a clone be different yeah. uh, they could be ha having various ways of um, Propagating their own population mm -hmm. and their own, uh, their own, hum you know, their own being. Yeah. So we take that. I always look, uh, think about it and think about, you know, why we so in certain areas, even in the computer science, comes to AI when it comes to and comes to space. Why are we so hell bent on male and female which is which is important i think it's important but we have to go beyond the binaries and think about we are sending a human being to mars we and that's how it should be you know it's not like sending a man to mars we're sending a woman which is it's good it's. but we more than anything we are actually sending a human being to a planet that's completely alien us as human beings it's not about a man stepping foot there you know neil armstrong is great there were so many women who went to space after that. I don't even see those records of those, you know. Right. Just, they don't talk about so many women who were out of space. And, um, so I think it's important for us to slowly think about gender-neutral ways of obtaining in, in the future. And that's the future. It's not all about being, uh, you know, male or female, but it's, um, you know, that's important. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying that we need to go beyond that too. Because times they say, "Hey, you cannot deny that it's always binary, male and female." I get yeah. it. I I, I know, um, but we have to move beyond that too, because there are beings out there. We may probably be fascinated next twenty years if we find somebody, some a creature who, you know, who yeah. look at us and saying, <laughs> "You guys are so primitive." <laughs> yeah. In your well, reproductive uh, methodology. Yeah. yeah, I like what you said about. Uh, the, 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 if the, if somebody was to come from outside of, mm -hmm. of of Earth and say, "Well, you're a human being first, aren't you?" It would they would mm -hmm. eliminate um, color. Mm -hmm. They would eliminate uh, the, the because that's not what they would see first. They would see 
all of us being the same as human beings. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, and I've always thought about that, and it's like uh, sci-fi is, is set aside and everything, because I, I think Gene Rottenberry and a whole lot of other uh, wonderful sci-fi writers out there um, writing about this and how we should mm-hmm. all be equal. Um, all that set aside, that I've always thought of well, aren't we all just human beings first? And it's like, and then this. So, if we're all just human beings, shouldn't we all be seen equally? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think they see equality. When they look at human race, they travel and look at Earth as a small planet. And um, it's fascinating because it's such a tiny planet. And yet, there's so much of density and there's so much that's going on within this tiny planet. That's how they look at me. This is a planet and they seem to be some intelligence in life form in this planet. And when they look at us and they look at people, when they really go through the lens, when they really fly into the continents and into the land and they realize that human beings are fighting against each other, they're going to be fascinated. <laughs> as to why are you fighting against each other you know you're the same race yeah. they won't even look at as pet, they will not color they will not look at caste then gender sexual identity anything none of that is going to matter and we are so silly we look so silly in their eyes as to why are you guys fighting you know why can't you just focus on something important save your planet or don't you want to save your planet instead of right. fighting with each other and there's so much going on as well that we are focused in just building monuments for ourselves. We don't build pathways that are really important for our younger generation, and that's the biggest problem today. Yeah. Yeah, see, you, you just answered my next question. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and because I, because I, was, I, 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 I mm. think that that is our biggest problem is we can't see each other as equals first. And once we find, finally see each other as equals, you know, um, there's a whole lot of other things that have just fallen into place, you know. Um, and, well, okay, so so with that being said, that's one of the things that I do when you started telling me about your company and how you help com- other mm-hmm. companies, that, is, that it, it was more about let's help human beings first. That was the number one agenda. Let's help you human beings. So, um, one, it, I mean, because it, it, your business is wrapped around how to, how to be inclusive. So, how do you, how do you start to help companies become inclusive in changing maybe those corporate policies that, that mm-hmm. were, as, as we've been been going uh, binary and making them so that they're inclusive and include everyone at all levels. Absolutely. I a very good point, uh, and I love this question because this is, I can talk about this question for an hour. I'm going to keep it as soon as possible. A lot of companies today are very performing. The reason I say that is because they just treat um, the the gender they just treat ethnicities they treat people you know you come and work in the company and leave but um there is no sense of belonging in the companies because they don't have the right policies in place they want to recruit people like 34 percent of the lgbtq community they leave because they find companies are not as inclusive at as they had branded earlier and they love recruiting but they don't know how to retain people so what happens is they don't have the right policies, the right ERG groups, program mentorship, the right procedures, how do you, um, what are kind of benefits. They don't think about a lot of that. They just hire people and they want you to exist in the company, but they don't want you to belong in the company. And a lot of them don't feel psychologically safe. And the leadership team always just outsources. I would say, I, I'm using the word outsource very loosely because they just leave the HR to care of all the people issues. The CEO says it's important for me to focus on money, you know, showing the investors how good they are. But it doesn't really pull it down to the uh, the inclusivity. What the leadership team shows is thus laid down to the every level within the company. 
So was employees don't trust the leadership today. That's the biggest problem I see. Don't trust the leadership. And the reason they don't trust leadership is because it doesn't ex exhibit those kind of uh, allyship uh, that absolutely important. You have good examples of Budweiser, Target, Starbucks, a lot of just flaking because there's so much news around, hey, you guys supporting the LGBT community, not be because they are destroying our children and they all this noise. The noise is the CEOs don't stand up and they just flake and completely uh, giving away uh, to all these conversations. And it's so appalling to me that um, you know, when you listen to these type of conversations in companies where the companies are not really mindful of their employees, the employees are watching. You see, target. You see, the products are not t taken away from the shelf. The employees in the company are watching, and they know this happens to the LGBTQ community. It happened to the employees who are Asians, who are black, who are minorities in that company, and Un unrecognized. Uh, folks in that company it can happen to anyone it can happen to a you know a black history month or a hispanic history month where they bring in certain things and then people can come and dismantle and say hey why are you focusing on it and that's the problem we have today it's because the leaders are not good examples they are not good stewards of their own products they are not good stewards within their own companies they are not examples and that needs to change when you when your leadership is you know when you trust in your leadership when you're transparent accountable and you will change your IG groups you will change the way in which you're doing business because it has been proved all the time that companies that are diverse can, are much more productive they're much more innovative they're much more competent to their people they really do well and in 2030 almost 70 to 75 percent of the workforce are going to be millennials and gen z's if companies don't ship up don't uh I, sorry if the companies don't shape up they're going to be shipped out and that's the problem we have today if yeah. they need to start thinking about the younger generation they need to start thinking about why and how they can make these changes so that they can be relevant they can be um they can make a meaningful difference in the community so there's a lot of work to be done and i things first thing is your leaders your employees and a change that you bring in should be transformed both internally and externally to your employees and your consumers Same time you want to bring in this change not as a performative thing but uh, very intentional very meaningful and that's the way companies can change and be relevant they can that's the only way they can make a change not only within their own within their own industry but also in the in the community that they are in in the in the they are in especially across the globe when they set example i think that that needs to happen yeah yeah um you it was something that you said back in 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 your story that um i remember being hired by the by it was my very first job as 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 as, a, as an analytical chemist right and um it finally came out this story came out about how i got hired and i got hired because um well he sounds like a by name i sounded like a good fit and then when they hired me they realized that they were getting something different than what the name represented but mm -hmm. they kept me because I was the token black person. Mm. And if you're the token, it doesn't matter if you're the token black person, you're the to token South Asian person, the, the token transgender person, the token gay person, it doesn't matter. The fact mm. of, of the word token right there means that you don't really fit there. That you don't really belong. You're just kept there because you're your eye candy. Mm -hmm. You look good on a, on 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 somebody's number sheet, <laughs> and is that really belonging, or do we need something <laughs> more? Right. Yeah, I think that's the problem we have today. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's um, 
The tokenism and pinkwashing is very common in the in industries. They just brand people. Uh, they treat you like a commodity. And if they start investing in the lives of people, start giving them a psychologically safe environment, if they start think thinking about or so much percentage of folks with disabilities, so many LGBTQ mm -hmm. folks in our company, so many folks with different ethnicities and race, and how do you really make sure that they feel like they belong in the company? They will make some this tokenism has become so common and now with all that's going on in this country especially with close to 105 more plus anti-trans bills and on anti-lgbtq bills across different states today what we see is companies and people who are really want who really want to make a change are the ones stand up they speak up and they show up and then they literally stand up against these bullies who keep saying that you cannot say gay, you cannot have this book, you cannot be a trans, you cannot use my bathroom, you this one. And it's so, you know, haven't we learned anything from our history? Didn't we have issues for colored people in the bathrooms? Didn't we go through all that just a couple of decades back? Mm -hmm. And have we learned anything? You can't go and tell me to use a uh, a, ma a, a, a man men's bathroom because I will get harassed there. <laughs> I, I, I I don't feel if even traveling today to Florida, and this is happening in 2023, where I cannot go to a bathroom. I cannot go to this bathroom. If I go to the men's bathroom, I'll get reported. If I go to the men's bathroom, I'm going to get harassed, and they will beat me up. Then they're not going to like me walking into their bathrooms and saying, you know, I'm actually, and I'm outing myself when I do that. And when I out myself, what happens is it's not good for my safety. And they're going to follow me. And if somebody, if they're not interested in, if they hate trans people, they are going to target me. It's like having a target on your back when you tell people, and my ID says something different. It's like having a target on your back, going to the doctor's office and sitting there and telling them that I am Celia, this is my authentic gender. They say, oh, I'll only call you for birth. That's what the medical community wants. Actually, that's complete BS. It doesn't. So there's so much change that needs to happen in our ecosystem today, within the medical side, within the community, within the workplace, faith places, faith communities. There's a lot of issues that are around today which we need to start changing. This tokenism has to end. You cannot tell, even in some places they say, hey, you're welcome here. Actually, welcome here, but its inclusivity has become like you know you're all welcome to the party but don't keep the coaster here and Celia for you there is a bathroom downstairs and uh, can you not come in this dress or and that's not being welcome you need to the inclusivity integrate to the procedures and policies and the framework and the culture of the company if it's not then you're only being performative you're just touching the surface and companies that are just at the surface will not last for a long time. They will have issues in the longer run because the younger generation, when they come into these companies, the way they view companies, the way they look at companies, the way they look at the financials, the way they look at the corporate, um, which the company is interacting with the community, of how relevant they are in a community matters to them. And if that doesn't exist, they don't want to join these companies. My daughter is 24 years old now, and she has done energy and sustainability. She's very picky on which company she wants to work with. She doesn't want to work for oil, oil, big oils. She is very clear about certain companies because she says, I don't want to work with this company because this token, uh, you know, they talk about environment and climate change, but they're really not there. They're, getting, they're lobbying for their own thing. And she knows, and to me, how it is going to be if the companies don't really transform they are going to become less relevant in their, their own industry yeah uh, it's a challenge for these companies for the ceos yeah it's, it's a lot <laughs> yeah but it's good it's a good thing it's a good thing it, yeah it and it does sound like a, a good thing it sounds like a um a quote book, uh, a brave new world. <laughs> uh, but Absolutely, it does, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, if you you started your your company 
with the with inclusiveness um, involved, it was one of the basis of it. Is that something do you would advise any any of the startups that you that you might encounter to start with inclusiveness first? Yeah, I think when I started my company, I I I. I don't know if I answered your previous question on that. When I started my company, I chose to make sure that I learn in the industry first and also help in what I'm doing. Like I educate the employers. I started thinking about my own. Um, so it's not about a theoretical concept of LGBTQ, how you're inclusive, but my stories were absolutely relevant to uh, the employers. So I started it educating companies as to how you hire trans and gender diverse folks. I literally walked them through the people process and technology changes they need to make. And organizational change management, that's a really important in order for them to hire trans folks. And I trained them, them and showed them how to do it. And I also ran those projects for them. And the same, that's what I did as a company. It wasn't just a one hour conversation, a theoretical conversation and telling them this is what you do. Or it's not an app where you go and pick and choose some survey but literally showing them every bit of walking them through it. It's a 30, 90 day kind of process and then walking them through it, helping them and hand holding them because a lot of times companies are wanting to do the right thing, but they don't know how. So you need to show them how to do it. So that's what I do with the companies. I just don't tell them, I just don't throw them under the bus because a lot of companies really want to do the good thing. And when I saw the startups, startups are much more easier because they can adopt these changes at a much early stage within their framework of the company, the mm -hmm. culture of the company. Startups are more open, but I found it more difficult companies that are big, that are large, that are global. It's very difficult to implement even a self ID within those companies. You know, it's difficult to come out as trans in certain parts of the world. Um, so there is a lot of mindfulness when it comes into how you can adopt or how companies can be accepting to the LGBTQ community. And um, another thing that I also found was, um, especially when you're working, uh, and what I do with my company is I took my own industry that I was working with, you know, it's as a, um, a health care. And I thought, this is the industry that I spent 25 years, and what can I do within this industry? How can I, how can a transon like me create a change within my own industry? And when I started looking, it was exciting because I found that the, the, the industry's functions but when the patients happens to be, uh, when they happen to be trans or trans men who are black or trans women who are Asian, they are not, they don't know how to treat them. They don't know how to retain those patients when they have a clinical trial. They don't know how to take care of those patients when they have an adverse event and they want to report a case. They don't know how to take care of them. And even when they have a medical data, the HIPAA regulations that are there um, and the data that is stored for the patients it's absolutely i'm i'm looking at it from a from a people process and a technology standpoint within the healthcare industry and thinking about how can you really help a patient if you don't really understand the patient mm -hmm. you understand this demographics if you don't really understand them your consumer patients are your consumers they are your customers but if you don't understand your patients how can you take care of them you're just making these medicines but do you know that how these medicines are going to react to a patient who is already going through hormones because you only consider the sex at birth and that's what they even call today but if i have taken taking medicines if my i'm already going through testosterone or estrogen there's already another change going on in my body and the medicines can interact with it could cause some adverse so they don't keep that in mind they don't know about them. Osteoporosis is a drug one of the clients making. No, no, this is could affect trans men and also trans women. And they didn't know that because um, and pap smear can affect. Uh, you know, we need we need all. If a trans woman is going, if a trans man is going for pap smear, and you know, how are they being treated? They're not treated uh, well because they they have bias there. If a trans woman goes for prostate exam they have not medically transitioned now that's being you know there is a bias right there there's so much of bias in the healthcare industry even I had a hard time coming out to my doctor I had to educate my doctor about gender dysphoria so I felt that if I'm establishing I want to educate as a trans person how can I really make a difference internally within the company and externally to the consumers about how to be more inclusive 
And that is the reason I established my company. And now I'm making so much inroads that I was selected as one of the top 20 LGBTQ leaders in the biopharma industry this year. Just, um, you know, yeah. just last month I was given this title, which is a, because that's what we need to do. And that's our expertise. That's my expertise. Um, it, talking about trans is important, but how do you make a difference in the business is also important to me. Yeah. And that's where I think I was make some dent in those companies. So yeah. it's oh, interesting. And I love it. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that is definitely pioneering work. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, uh, you know, one of the areas I'm focused right now, equity and diversity in clinical trials, because yeah. uh, that's where a lot of things can happen. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. We are starting to run <laughs> out of time. Um, what is it? The, what is the, the the ultimate impact that you want to make on our world? Um, and and then if you can tell people how to get a hold of you and 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 work with you because uh, because you're valid to their industry. Absolutely. So uh, the two areas that I focus is economic empowerment of the expansive community. This mm-hmm. across all industries, and especially within my own industry, which is healthcare and life sciences. I want to make sure that people understand their own patients, as I was explaining earlier, and that's one area that I focus on, like clinical trials how can you make it more meaningful for patients uh, because that's the vulnerable population where they're really they're being misunderstood they're being marginalized so educating that industry i've been educating doctors nurses having sessions with um, you know lots of nurses and ad- i'm actually doing another session for uh, a therapist group today uh, so there are a lot of groups that i talk about and i'm also in the odyssey which is um, a conference for trans community especially it's attended by all the medical providers so i started looking at the four pillars of healthcare and thinking about how can i make a change not just medical providers the the providers the payers the pharmaceutical companies and the policy how do you really make a change in order for them to be more inclusive to the expansive community so when i started thinking about it that's what i focus on and that's where i feel like i can influence uh, any medical community that that space so if you want to get hold of me you can find me on linkedin you can literally google celia sandhya daniels you will find me <laughs> but um make it easy just go to linkedin and uh, type in celia sandhya daniels you will find me i'm also on twitter again at celia sand daniels uh, sa and daniels and um facebook um, and other social media you know instagram you can find me and uh, if you have a need in your company you can always reach out to me because I can bring a global perspective of how do you really make an inclusive environment so the future I want to look at it as I want the whole plan be more inclusive that one day we will never talk about our race our ethnicity we will just talk about how do we save up <laughs> you know just think about what else yeah. can we do yeah. um, it won't be a conversation around ethnicities but around empowering people people em- empowering people is the future that i want to be in yeah you, know, you you're doing you're doing wonderful work and but i i love that, that i got the opportunity to actually speak with you and have you on our show um and i hope that a lot of our our listeners and viewers actually um start to work with you so that, so that we can we can trans we can transition away from all these mm-hmm. different categories and boxes and just click one box that says hey I'm a human being um, and I, th- I think that would be like the one of the ult- most ultimate things to, to have us do as a human race um, mm-hmm. so thank you for your work it, and it's wonderful thank you everybody for listening today um please do uh find cecilia daniels and work with her find out how especially if you're a startup find out how you can actually be more inclusive with your with your processes and how you hire people how you work with people and everything so um and thank you for subscribing and we will talk to everybody later thank you cecilia it's been wonderful and big hugs and i love the work you're doing thank you glenn i really appreciate what you're doing and thank you for um 
resonating my voice and uh, helping people like me in your podcast i really appreciate it thank you This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.